Hi, I'm Katie Crane, and this is the Pilates Lounge. Hi everyone, my name is Katie Crane. I'm the Pilates professional. Welcome to another episode of the Pilates Lounge podcast. Now, today's episode is not a new topic. In fact, this is a topic that is woven through the season many, many times. We first spoke about this topic in episode five of this season, and then we continued to talk about this topic throughout the season, right down through to episode 37, and again today in episode 41. The topic of today's discussion is, of course, the pelvic floor. And this topic continues to be woven throughout the program many, many times because it has so many different layers, especially from the perspective of a Pilates professional. Now, inherently, Pilates professionals talk about the core a lot. And there is this assumption of many, many people who come and see us for Pilates that part of the outcome of practicing Pilates is a stronger core and a stronger pelvic floor. I cannot count how many clients have come to us over the years telling us that they need to, in inverted commas, strengthen their pelvic floor. And so this is one of the reasons that I continue coming back to this topic, to really hone in on our understanding of pelvic floor, what it is, what it should be, appropriate language that we should be using with clients and potential issues that you may be seeing as Pilates professionals when you're working with clients. Because sometimes when a client comes to us and tells us that they've got something, they are bringing that information third hand. So they've told somebody that they've got something going on, that somebody has told them that that's because your pelvic floor is weak. Now, unless that person has had internal examination by a pelvic floor specialist, we don't know whether or not that information that then we are receiving is factual. So I do want to recommend that if a client comes to you and they tell you that they have been told that they need to strengthen their pelvic floor, personally, I always ask the client, who it is that they received that information from. And if the person that they received the information from was not a pelvic floor specialist, then personally, I take that information with a very big teaspoon of salt. So then there's a couple of ways that we could go about this when we are given this information by a client. Well, of course, we could assume that the client, what the client is telling us is true. That's up to you as a professional to decide that. But we could also either send that client to a pelvic floor specialist. And if you don't have a pelvic floor specialist, there are many questions and many open conversations we could start to have with that client to I guess start to piece the puzzle together the best that we can as Pilates professionals. Now, I do want us all always working within our scope of practice. So your scope of practice as a Pilates professional is constantly emerging. The more clients you work with, the broader your scope of practice becomes, the more study you've done, the broader your scope of practice becomes and the more you really start to understand the anatomy of movement, which is very specific anatomy of movement, then the broader your scope of practice is going to become. And what I mean by that is that when we start our Pilates instructing or when we start teaching Pilates, quite often, and I'm sure I've said this before, we step out of the gate being able to teach repertoire. That is the foundation of 
a Pilates instructor. So that is our beginning. That is the beginning of our path to becoming a Pilates professional. If we want to work with people who have um, any kind of pain, any kind of dysregulation in the body, they're they want to recover from injury or they have something chronic or acute or even if they just have something a little bit curly that maybe we're not we're not that familiar with then we need to do further study now further study of course could be um, in a workshop, it could be working alongside somebody who has more experience than what we do in that moment. So maybe working with a mentor. It could be from reading articles, from gaining insight from somebody else. So maybe asking questions from, for example, this person's pelvic floor specialist and getting information where then you could start to apply appropriate exercises, use appropriate language and help that client move forwards from whatever condition it it is that they've got. So today it's about pelvic floor dysfunction. But I do definitely want us all to be open to continually learning. Every single client that walks in the door and every single person that we work with is an opportunity for us to learn more. So whatever it is that we know today is going to be different to what we know tomorrow. And it's okay for us to change our approach as we learn things as well. I remember the good old days when I first started teaching and I was teaching everybody to in inverted commas, elevate pelvic floor or draw up pelvic floor in a lot of exercises that I was teaching. I no longer do that. Instead, what I've learned to do is to cater to the unique individual needs of every single person within the room. So whether that's in a class situation, like in a bigger class situation, or whether that's with a one-on-one or a small semi-private of clinical people, it's very, very important that we are working towards being able to speak to every single person in the room. Now, that can be really difficult when we first start out as Pilates professionals. And partly that's because We are limited by our own understanding of what it is that could be happening in the body. We are also limited by our ability to read people. That that is definitely a skill that we have to learn along the way because sometimes somebody will tell us something, but it's not actually the truth. So for example, somebody might come into the studio and you're like, hey, how are you going today? And they say, oh, I'm fantastic. How are you? Little conversation ensues. They've told you that they are fantastic. Well, then they've got no problems. They've just told you that. But there are so many people that come into the studio and potentially we've done it ourselves where we walk around with this smile plastered on our face We walk around with a smile plastered on our face, telling the world outwardly that we're fantastic, where in reality, we are holding fear, anxiety, sadness, stress, shame, or guilt. So it takes a long time for us as professionals to read the room. And There's probably no other way to learn how to read the room, but to work for many, 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 many hours with many, many, many different bodies. But over the years, I've definitely gained more of a skill set in being able to see past people's initial response to me welcoming them into the studio. And That kind of brings us into the specific topic today, which is all about how stress and can actually tighten the pelvic floor and what we can do about it. So I want to paint a picture for you as as we step into this conversation. I don't know about you, but if I think about what goes on in my body, when I'm in a super scary situation 
And a super scary situation might be a situation that I've put myself in. I remember one time I worked for a company and we did a group training exercise, which was jumping out of an aeroplane. When I look back on that exercise, I'm like, holy moly, what was this company thinking? But at the time, as a thrill seeker, I thought that it was the best team building experience that anybody could ever bring up. So there we are as a team. I worked at a, at a swimming centre at the time. So all of us lifeguards, swimming coaches, the managers, the fitness uh, instructors, we all went out to this place where we jumped in groups of three in these little aeroplanes and we flew up into the sky and we each had an instructor and we were jumping out of a plane. I, I don't even know how high it was, but it was like somewhere above the clouds. And this was way before my Pilates instructing days, but I was wor still working in fitness. I was still working with the body. So I had a very good awareness of, of my body working. And I remember feeling how my sphincter just tightened. My, my sphincter was like pulsating with fear as I sat on the edge of that aeroplane ready to jump out. I will never forget the feeling of my pelvic floor working overtime in that state of fear. And as we jumped out of the aeroplane, I was connected to my instructor who was on the back of me. I just remember feeling like that tightness went so deep up into my body that I could actually then feel a constriction in the back of my throat. It was such a deep wind up. And I guess I probably recognize the whole sensation more now because I do work with complex conditions and I do understand the anatomy of the body and specifically anatomy of movement so much better. But even when I think about doing that again, if I think about jumping out of the aeroplane, my body naturally goes into that wound up state and it literally did go from my sphincter right up deep into my body and into the back of my mouth. Now, I'm not the only one who's ever been in a state of fear like that. You know, there are many other things that I've done throughout my life that has given me a similar experience. I, I remember walking home late at night and thinking that I was being followed by somebody and I got the same experience, this wind up through the back end of what I now understand is part of my pelvic floor. So think of any state of shock, of fear that you may have been put in or have put yourself in over your lifetime. Maybe it's rock climbing. Maybe you jumped out of an airplane too. Maybe it was standing in front of the class for the first time and having to talk publicly. That can be super scary for people. Maybe it was asking your now husband on your very first date. That can be super scary. Maybe it was when you're at high school and you had to do a presentation or you know you did did something silly when you were at school and you were in front of everybody and thought that everybody was laughing at you. Maybe it was when you first went and practiced driving a car and you went for your first lesson. I remember that being super scary. There are so many things that we so many situations that we put ourselves into that agitate the experience or the emotion of fear throughout our lives. And all of those experiences will naturally initiate the posterior pelvic floor. So that's just a natural stress response when it comes to fear. And partly that has to do with what is cool, called the HPA axis. So the HPA axis is the hypothalamus, uh, the pituitary gland, and our adrenals. And all of those guys work together to both sense danger, but also exhibit in the body an output of a fear response. Now, 
if we, and that's partly all to do with adrenaline and cortisol as well. So if we, so our adrenaline is like uh, the initial fear response or the initial response to perceived danger is we get a hit of adrenaline and that and that adrenaline it has like a, about a one to two hour timeline. So you're not going to feel adrenaline for any more than one to two hours. Then our long-term stress response is recognized as cortisol. So both of those guys work together to both keep us very aware. Adrenaline in particular keeps us very aware of our surroundings so that we can have the energy and have the power and have the capability to deal with something that may be putting us under stress. So when I was about to jump out of the airplane, definitely I had a lot of adrenaline coursing through my body. And part of that, that reflex response or that primitive response is for my pelvic floor to tighten up because my body is naturally not going to want to go to the bathroom or evacuate when I'm under that high stress. So some things that that happen is I'm not going to pass a stool. I'm not going to go to the bathroom when I'm under that extreme stress. It doesn't make sense. But also my digestion is going to be affected. So I'm not digesting food anymore. And quite often that can end up presenting itself as something like, uh, you know, as belly ache or a gut issue. Uh, if you've ever been in that situation, then it's quite common for you to feel the stress in your gut as well. But your gut, the end of your gut, of course, is your posterior and your anterior pelvic floor. So it's really normal. But if, and that's a normal reflex just for your adrenaline, right? So your body is wired to be able to deal with that immediate threat or that immediate danger. But ideally, once your body has experienced that immediate threat or danger, so once I landed on the ground safely, it actually it actually did take a couple of hours. I mean, I, I felt sick for a couple of hours and that was part of that adrenaline response in my body. So it is natural if you felt that fear, then it's natural for you to have a lot of physical responses as part of that hit of adrenaline in your body. So your tummy might hurt, you might get a headache, um, you might feel really parched in the mouth, you might not want to eat for a while, you might feel quite thirsty, you might find that you've got really heightened senses. So like your hearing increases, that's part of that adrenaline stress response. You may find that you can smell a lot better. That's also part of it. But I do want you to recognize that this is this does definitely affect the pelvic floor. Now, after about an hour, two hours, then your body should naturally go back to its normal calm state. And in an ideal situation, that's exactly what happens. You have this high stress response and then you're good, no problem. But we also don't all live in this ideal situation. So then when we have a long, sustained stress response, then cortisol has to take over. So cortisol is how our body deals with long-term stress. And if we have that long-term stress, then that can also affect the pelvic floor tightening as well, both posterior and anterior. So posterior pelvic floor is the wall of the anus. Anterior pelvic floor for females is the wall of the vagina and for men is the shaft of the penis. So both can be affected by long-term stress as well. Now, if your body is going through stress long-term, then naturally your body is not going to want to have babies. And we hear this all the time from men and women who are trying to conceive that you say they've been trying to conceive for a couple of years, nothing has happened. They've done 
all the things to help themselves to conceive and then they go off on a holiday, they're no longer stressed at work, they're no longer surrounded by their everyday stressful experiences and lo and behold, they get pregnant. So this is because the body will not reproduce when we are under stress. The body will naturally go into this stress response or what's the word? The body will naturally respond to long-term stress by trying to protect itself. And part of that protection mechanism is not getting pregnant because why would any animal in nature want to bring a baby into the world if it perceived that its life was under threat. And when we feel stress, the brain automatically assumes that it is life-threatening. So the brain is always working to keep us alive. That is the brain's job. So any stress that we're feeling, especially this long-term stress, and and long-term stress can be brought about by relationship problems, environmental factors, stress at work, stress in friendships, financial stresses, even perceived stress. So if you're constantly feeding your brain with watching the news and scrolling through social media and picking up on really bad vibes all the time, then I'm sure I've spoken about it before, but your brain actually cannot distinction, distinguish between what is real and what is not reality. So if you're watching seasons of Lost or seasons of Vikings or you know whatever it is that you're watching and it's not a romantic rom-com, <laughs> then your brain actually assumes that that stress that you're watching on television is reality. And even that can impede on your body's ability to relax, to digest food, to sleep well, to recover, to relax the pelvic floor. So when we are under stress, the pelvic floor will naturally tighten because the body does not want to conceive, does not want to let anything in, does not want to be vulnerable. And so when our pelvic floor is relaxed, and I'm not saying switched off because the pelvic floor is always switched off, but when the pelvic floor is in a relaxed state, both posterior and anterior, or you know, either or, but both together, ideally when we are able to relax the pelvic floor, that is when we are most vulnerable as human beings. So if you don't want, if you're feeling like you cannot allow yourself to be vulnerable, if you're not trusting your environment, if you've, you know, always looking behind you or, you know, or you perceive that you're threatened in any way, then your pelvic floor will tighten. So then when somebody comes into the studio and say they walk into the studio and we ask them, hey, how are you going today? And they look at us and they say, oh, yeah, everything's great. Well, that's not always the case. Quite often people come into the studio and even though they tell us that they're great, we're very, very good at not revealing exactly how we are feeling. We are very good at just telling people what they want to hear. And then they come to their Pilates class and they're told for an entire hour to elevate the pelvic floor, switch on the pelvic floor, lift the pelvic floor, squeeze the pelvic floor, and those muscles are already bit wound up, then we're actually doing more damage than good for those people. So what we want to do in a Pilates class is to speak to everybody in the class and never assume that everybody needs to tighten their pelvic floor anymore. It's pretty safe to assume that probably half the class needs to learn how to unwind those muscles, how to release those muscles. So what are some things that we could do to help encourage for those muscles to be unwound, but also strong at the same time? Some great things that I love doing with people is simple breath work. So the pelvic floor, anterior and posterior, so the front and the back of the pelvic floor, through your poo hole and through your pee hole, as David and I spoke about the other week, is intricately designed to work 
with breath. So anytime I inhale, then my diaphragm, as I inhale, my diaphragm descends or goes down in the body to allow for room in the lungs to fill with oxygen. And as my diaphragm descends, then in turn, my pelvic floor also descends. So my pelvic floor is working, but it's working with more length in the muscles. As I breathe out, my pelvic floor and my diaphragm ascend. So as I breathe out, naturally, there's that sensation of my pelvic floor, I guess, tightening or elevating. So people who are stressed, it's normal for them to not be breathing deeply. So when we're super stressed, then we're shallow breathing. Can you imagine like, you know, running from a saber-toothed tiger and taking deep breaths in and out of your nose. No, you're not going to be able to. You're going to be breathing shallow through your mouth. So one of the great benefits of Pilates and something that we can be doing with people to help them actually get better contraction and more dynamic contraction through the pelvic floor, ending up with a deeper contraction, not only a deeper elevation or a deeper uh, concentric contraction, but also a a more whole and more dynamic eccentric contraction. So those muscles working not to switch off, but to open wide is deep breathing in and out. The more we breathe in, the more those pelvic floor muscles are going to expand. And then the deeper we breathe out, the deeper those pelvic floor muscles are going to elevate. So just deep breathing exercises can really help with people who are wound up in the pelvic floor. Now, people who are wound up in the pelvic floor, not only could they end up with things like constipation, so remember, we should be passing stool at least one time a day, but my friend who works with colon therapy, so um, she flushes people's colons out, she, she tells me that it's actually really, really common for some people not to be passing stool for up to three or four days. So a lot of people that she sees they're surprised to learn that they should be passing stool one time a day. If you're not passing stool one time a day, then your body is not digesting the food that you are eating and your body is not evacuating the toxic waste that your body can that can no longer serve your body. And it means partly you, that you have a tight posterior pelvic floor. So we can really help those people in a Pilates class by doing some deep breathing technique to help them allow for the pelvic floor to lengthen or to relax or to work much more dynamically so that it's not so wound up and held all the time. When pelvic floor is wound up and held, not only can we end up constipated, but we can also end up not properly releasing our bladder entirely. And what happens when we don't entirely release the bladder is A, we end up holding urine that the body needs to get rid of and that urine can become quite stagnant and quite toxic for the body. We can end up with uh, bladder bladder infections, kidney infections, but also when we don't evacuate the bladder entirely, then we can have a sensation of needing to go to the toilet all the time. And it's not that you need to go to the toilet all the time, it's that you weren't able to fully relax your pelvic floor when you were going to the toilet, so then you didn't fully evacuate all of the contents in the bladder. So again, Deep breathing exercises can really help with these people. And it's not that we're necessarily having these conversations in the Pilates studio. It's not like I'm asking people, how many times are you going to the bathroom every day? Are you evacuating stool daily? How many times are you peeing every day? Are you evacuating your bladder entirely? But I am going through these deep breathing exercises within the class, at the start of the class, at the end of the class, and I'm explaining to the class the purpose of these deep breathing exercises and explaining to the class that it's actually really common for a lot of people to have these issues. And in that way, nobody has to put up their hand and say, oh yeah, well that's me because nobody's going to do that in a class situation. But it's giving people information so then they don't feel like they're crazy or that they're, you know, that they're the only dysfunctional people in the world. 
they're then recognizing that, wow, this dysfunction that I've got is really common and there's things that I can do to help alleviate these problems. Now, if my pelvic floor is why it wound up tight, our pelvic floor ends up becoming part of our gut. So if my pelvic floor is wound up tight, then gut dysbiosis or gut issues is a really common complaint for people who have tightness in the pelvic floor. If my pelvic floor is tight, I'm not evacuating things. Remember, I'm not digesting things as well. I can also end up on top of gut issues or digestive issues, also deep pelvic pain. When those muscles are wound up and they're tight, if you imagine the muscles of the pelvic floor, they actually attach to the very bottom of the pelvis. So if you turn the pelvis upside down and had a look at the bottom of the pelvis, your pelvic floor grows out of the very bottom of the sacrum. So the bottom of the the tailbone, right, which is the extension of the spine, but also it grows out of the bottom of the ilium, which are the two big bones on either side of the pelvis. So the pelvis is made up of three bones, the ilium, two big ilium, which at the front, if you were to put your fingertips on the front of your pelvis, you'll feel two little bones at the front. I call them your headlights. They're your ASIS, anterior superior iliac spine. But then if you follow those bone, that bone all the way down through the front, then you'll feel your pubic bone at the front and your pubic bone or your pubic symphysis has a connection at the front. So that's actually those two ilium coming together. And then if you followed that all the way down between your thighs, you would continue to feel the bones of the pubic, of the the ilium on either side. Pelvic floor grows out of that And if you kept following that down around to your sits bones, the bony bits of your bottom that you sit on, if you're sitting on a on a bar stool or something, your pelvic floor grows out of all of that as well. Now, like I said, your pelvic floor consists of a lot of different muscles, but they all work in concert together to both squeeze your butthole, squeeze your anus, squeeze your sphincter, hold up connect through the anterior or the front of your pelvic floor. So hold your urine, hold your bladder, but also support the lowest part of your spine and support your pelvis. Now, so if those muscles are tight and imagine those muscles almost being a little bit circular, they kind of all wrap around within your pelvis. And imagine if you kept tightening a circle, then that tightening of the circle is going to start to pull the bones of your pelvis together. And so some people who have tight pelvic floor end up with a deep pain in their pelvis and they can't figure out where that pain comes from. Well, if we can help those people unwind their pelvic floor, unwind the inside, unwind that tightening of the pelvic floor, then we can actually help them alleviate some of that painful, that pain that is related to the excessive tightening. Some other ways to do that as well as breathing. So breathing is a fantastic one. But also when we're doing things like deep squats, then allowing for the clients, for our students, to feel how the pelvis actually opens in the deep squat can be really, really beneficial. So somebody with a tight pelvic floor is really good at closing things up, really good at winding things up, really good at elevating, but they're not necessarily necessarily so good at allowing things to widen, to spread, and to release. And that's really what they need to do. So Deep squatting exercises can be great. Sitting on the floor or sitting on a machine with your legs crossed in a genie position, a a kneeling position can be really good. Kneeling, allowing for your sits bones to rest onto the heels. 
any of your four-point kneeling can be really great. And when we're four-point kneeling, we don't need to then be cueing for the pelvic floor to elevate. The pelvic floor is doing the opposite now. Now, if you've ever had a baby and given birth naturally, it's a natural primal position for women to want to be on when they're giving birth is actually to be on all fours or even to be in a squatting position. And it's actually one of the most beneficial and successful ways for women to give birth naturally is to be on all fours or in a squatting position because it naturally allows for pelvic floor to open wide. So when we do exercises in Pilates and we're getting people to be In a four-point kneeling position, we don't want to be encouraging them to be winding up anymore. We're certainly not cueing for them to bear down either, but if anything, this is where transverse abs might take over. So this is where transverse abs are just gently pulling in away from the floor, but sits bones are definitely really nice and wide. Pelvic floor is still working. Remember, all of our muscles are working appropriately, but pelvic floor certainly is not winding up here. So great exercise for people who do have that that excessive stress in their life, the emotional stress that then may be winding up their pelvic floor is for them to be on four-point kneeling. I often do these kind of like puppy dog tail wags, you know, allowing for the pelvis to move freely in that position. You could do anything of your four-point kneeling, but you certainly want to allow for the sit bones to be sitting wide. Any sitting with the legs over something. So you could be sitting on the barrel if you've got like a high barrel in your studio. So sitting on the barrel is a really great exercise to do. And then you could be doing some arm exercises, whether it's with a TheraBand or with some hand weights, but just allowing for the pelvis or for the legs to splay over either sides of the barrel is really great. If you're not working with a barrel and you're rather doing mat mat exercises, then you could definitely be using a big fit ball. It's something that I often go to with my pregnant clients because I want to prepare their pelvic floor to allow to release. So I'm using the fit ball. And if you sit with your legs on either side of the fit ball, you can almost feel the bottom of the bones of your pelvis. So you can become very aware of the pubic bone, the tailbone and your sits bones. And you want to almost just roll around on the fit ball as you're sitting on it with your feet on the floor and your knees wide and allowing for this sense of massage in the bottom of the pelvis. It feels really nice, specifically for pregnant women, normally because they can kind of feel how the bones are starting to shift as the ligaments become a little bit lax. But if I'm working with somebody and I know that they're super stressed out, then I am going to assume that they probably have a little bit too much tightness in their pelvis floor or if they've already been to their pelvic floor specialist and they've been told that they have hypertonicity, so it's too much tone of the pelvic floor, then I'm actually working on doing things to help them release that first before we work the other core muscles. It's not that we're not working the core muscles, but the focus is different for these people. Of course, things like standing roll down is a great way to release or widen through the sits bones, widen through the posterior pelvic floor. And some people that you're going to see really, really common with tight posterior pelvic floor, so that's that feeling of squeezing the sphincter that happens when we're in fear, that's going to happen with people who do running sports. So primitively, running is something that we do when we're being chased by something or when we're chasing something. So there's a natural fear response when you're running. Interestingly, that's actually what people love. That's why people who run love running, right? Because they get this hit of adrenaline. They get this hit of the primitive fear response. That's fine if that's what they love, but they do need to be doing things to unwind, to come down out of that. Sometimes when we work with people who love running, they're not very good at unwinding. So my husband loves running. 
he loves being wound up. He loves that feeling. So he goes and does a gentle sauna. So the sauna helps him relax, not super hot, just a gentle sauna that's going to help calm his body and calm his mind. He also spends a lot of time fishing, and I'm sure that to him fishing is just like meditation. So we've got to find things for these uppity uppity people that love things like running um, to unwind as well. But also people who play ball sports, who are kicking balls. Uh, If you imagine what happens to the pelvis, if you kick a ball, a football, a soccer ball, then you're going to squeeze through that posterior pelvic floor every time you kick a ball. We often joke with our footy players that they've got a tight ass. (laughs) But actually what we're talking about is that posterior pelvic floor is a little bit wound up. So then we end up doing just a lot of things on hands and knees, things that is going to, you know, if you're always pushing that leg underneath and then forwards, then naturally that back and is going to wind up quite a bit. So then we want to do things that is the opposite of what they're doing in their chosen sport or activity. So kicking is a big one, running is a big one, but you might be able to think of some other activities. Swimmers that are that are swimming freestyle or that flutter kick also can be quite wound up in the pelvic floor. So then I get them to, in the pool, do things like either just in their deep water, I get them to do things where they're doing like egg beater kick, so allowing for their hips to widen and their knees to widen, but also doing some cross training of things like breaststroke kick as well. Really, really important that if we're working with somebody who is choosing to do an activity which naturally winds up the pelvic floor, especially that posterior pelvic floor, so that they have good bowel strength, but also good bowel practices. We want to make sure that we're opening those those joints and those muscles nice and wide, and we're cross-training them. But ultimately, we want to help our clients strategize on how to mitigate stress. So rather than assuming that everybody who comes into the studio needs to elevate their pelvic floor, we're constantly within the class situation, or even if it's one-on-one or a big class, it really doesn't matter. We're always having these discussions with people and letting them know that this is What might be happening in your body if you are feeling this? This is the reason that we practice the breath work. So often people come into the Pilates class and I feel like they assume that as soon as they come in, they've got to start moving to get the most out of their Pilates. But actually, it's the moments that we give our clients. It's the space that we create where they can be actively doing nothing where some of the greatest benefits happening. And it's when we're allowing for the unwinding of the insides that then long term, we know that that's what's going to be creating a stronger core. So if you're coming, if clients are coming into the Pilates class and they're already wound up, and then they're working their pelvic floor, they're actually, they're actually going to end up long term with a weaker pelvic floor. What we need to be doing with the majority of clients, I would say, because introduce me to somebody who doesn't live in a stressful environment. Introduce me to somebody who doesn't live half their life with fear. Introduce me to somebody who actually really consistently takes time to unwind and you will be introducing me to somebody who has a strong pelvic floor. So most of the population do come to us wound up. And a lot of our job is to help unwind first and then do the work and then unwind at the end again. This is just some food for thought. You know, I I do wonder how many people really consider how stress may be tightening the pelvic floor. And I hope that today's episode has really given you some strategies to start to work on, but also allows you to look at the exercises that you're doing with clients from a different lens. Now, I've got something exciting for you, and I kept meaning to say it, but I get taken away with the conversation that I'm having with myself. I've got this great program that I'm putting together. It's specifically a mentoring program 
for Pilates instructors. So if you are a Pilates instructor and you love this type of content and you want to understand more of it so that you can apply it to your clients and if you want to be able to go a little bit deeper and specifically ask questions about your unique clients so that you can start to really serve them from a place of uh, deeper knowledge and more skill, then this mentoring program is for you. Also, if you are a student of a Pilates certification currently and you want more out of your teacher training or you want support with your current teacher training, then this mentoring program is for you. Now, I want you to go to the website and type in www.the pilatesprofessional.com.au backslash mentor, M-E-N-T-O-R, me. And it will take you to a page that is going to give you a whole lot of information about my mentoring program that is only open to applications. So you need to apply for the mentoring program and then we will decide together whether or not this program is for you. This is something that has been in production for a long, long time and I'm so excited to be offering it to you guys now. And I know that this is going to elevate who you are as a Pilates professional, but also it's going to be such a wonderful way to integrate everything that we are talking about on this podcast for you to actually apply in your sessions with clients. My name's Katie Crane. I am the Pilates professional, and this is the Pilates Lounge podcast. Goodbye for now. Mm-hmm.